The Bible's account of origins is uh, challenged these days as it has never been challenged before. And many suggest that it's a lost cause for Christian people and for the Christian church. Conspiracy between Darwinism and radical atheism has poisoned the mind of Western society. However, the preferred version on origins nowadays makes little sense, not by anybody's standards, when it's pursued to its logical conclusion. But we're going to leave these arguments aside and take the narrative of Scripture at face value. And that should be a reminder to the young folk present here this evening that it is always best for you as you interact with your friends and your peers in schools and in colleges and when you eventually come into the workplace, always remember that trusting in the Word of God is one of the best things that you can do in your lives. It's the safest ground for you to stand on. But that requires a certain attitude towards the Bible. Historically, this used to be known as having a high view of Scripture. And that reflected the philosophy of Old Testament saints and prophets who lived by the dictum, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. In other words, if God says it, we must do it, and then say Amen. Sadly, the critical approach to the biblical text in the late 19th century has virtually destroyed the confidence of many people, perhaps even most people, in the Word of God. So now, the dictum has become not what saith God, but what saith the scholars. It has been devastating for society, and it has been devastating for the Christian church. However, to anyone with a modicum of respect for the Word of God, we should, be, uh, we should recognize not only the authority of Scripture, and this is, uh, we often, those of us in the reform uh, corner of Christianity, we often remind ourselves and our congregations that the Bible is the inspired, the infallible, and the inerrant Word of God. We should add a fourth. It is also the authoritative Word of God. It has authority over all our lives and over how we live our lives. Now, Eden, the Garden of Eden, that is, plays a hugely significant role in God's plan for humanity. And strangely, uh, the title of my um, topic here is Paradise Lost. And I take that from how we refer to the Garden of Eden as paradise. But the garden isn't referred to in this narrative as paradise, interestingly enough. But it is clearly alluded to in uh, the writing of the Apostle John when he was given the revelation in the island of Patmos. This is what he wrote in Revelation 2, verse 7. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of a tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. He's obviously, and I mentioned this further in a moment, obviously alluding to the Garden of Eden. And I think Eden, or the correlation between the Garden of Eden and heaven, lies behind the words that Jesus spoke to the thief on the cross when he said to him, Today thou shalt be with me 
in paradise. And the only other example we have of this term uh, in Scripture is in Paul's reference uh, to his experience when he informed the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 4 that he was caught up into paradise, whatever that may mean. So we have good reason to believe that the Garden of Eden was not and is not myth, fable, or parable. It was an actual place, an actual location on the face of this earth. And we must resist every and any suggestion, and uh, there are many of them, that makes, the, within the pale of the Christian church, that makes the Garden of Eden uh, either a myth or a parable. And that, of course, shouldn't surprise us that the uh, Eden paradise is being undermined in this way because we understand from Scripture that this is a crucial and significant development in God's plan for humanity. If we lose what is being taught in this portion of God's Word, then we are going to lose a proper, clear meaning of the gospel itself. <clears throat> and we realize, of course, that every major component of the gospel story has become fair game to cynics and skeptics and the enemies of righteousness. But meanwhile, the Garden of Eden was designed as a home for the first two inhabitants of this earth, two beautiful and perfect people who were given the most perfect environment imaginable in which they were to live. And the events that took place here at the dawn of history provides us with the key to understand virtually everything that is of significance to this world and especially to our own eternal destiny. So during this series, we're going to look at how this paradise was lost and we shall look at the consequence of this for humanity and we shall look at God's rescue mission in the gospel of redeeming grace. Let me look first of all then at the creation of this paradise. In chapter 2 verse 8 we read, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. When God finished his work of creation, the entire world could have qualified as a paradise. There wasn't a square inch on the face of the earth that wasn't perfect and that wasn't beautiful. We know that from a pronouncement God made when he finished his creation in Genesis 1 verse 31. God saw everything that he had made and behold it was very good. When God says something is very good you can't improve on that. So the entire world was a beautiful place, a perfect place. So Eden wasn't created as a particularly beautiful place in the sense that it was more beautiful than other parts of the creation. All of creation was of equal beauty. However, for his own glory, God set Eden apart. Now, we don't know the exact location of this garden other than what we have read, it was eastward in Eden. And nor do we know the dimensions of this garden. The language implies that it was some sort of an enclosed area. But whatever the case, it did require looking after. Chapter 2, verse 15, God took the man and put him in the garden to dress it and to keep it. And here, by the way, is where we get the Protestant work ethic from. And I'm going to mention just in the passing 
um, five very important principles that God established in the Garden of Eden at the dawn of history. And the young people here should pay attention to these five principles. We sometimes refer to them as five ordinances, for they are of abiding relevance to the whole human race. These are the Sabbath, marriage, procreation, the work ethic, and subduing the earth. Now, these are simple principles or ordinances. They create a framework within which humanity can pursue its full potential. A framework within which humanity can pursue its full potential. And all the un unbiblical developments in the world ever since then only confirm to us how right God was. But meanwhile, God adorned paradise with two special trees. We read in chapter 2, verse 9, the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now we can speculate all day on which type of trees these were. It is not revealed to us in the word of God whether there were common fruit trees made holy for this purpose or unique trees unlike any other tree that ever grew in the earth. It matters little. Either way, it really matters little. What's important for us to note is that God set these two trees apart. They were given a unique role in a unique environment for a unique purpose. And nor is it wise to speculate on the nature of the fruit that grew on those trees. Some folk ask, and I'm sure perhaps you have asked this question yourselves, was there something inherent to the fruit growing on those trees to, on the one hand, convey superintelligence by eating the fruit, indicated by, uh, verse 9, knowledge of good and evil? Or was there something inherent to the fruit capable of conveying eternal life by eating the fruit indicated by what we didn't read, chapter 3, verse 22. Lest he put forth his hand and take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. How literally should we take this? Shouldn't we view these words similar to how we view the words of the Lord Jesus when he instituted the Lord's Supper in the upper room. When he said in Matthew 26, verse 26, this is my body pointing to a bit of bread. When he said, this is my blood pointing to a cup of wine. We don't take these words literally, not like the Roman Catholic Church does, when they have ended up with an error of transubstantiation, the Protestant view of these words is that they were symbolic and sacramental. And I believe that that is the best way to understand how the, these two trees functioned and their fruit. They were sacramental in value. Later on, <coughs> In the history of the Old Testament, there's frequent association between the ideas of spiritual life and a well-watered garden or well-watered trees. We were singing about this in our opening praise in Psalm 1. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth fruit in a season. 
This is repeated again by the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 17, verse 8. He shall be as a tree planted by the waters. So these trees were real, but their value was sacramental. There can be no blessing, my friends. There can be no benefit. There can be no curse and there can be no condemnation apart from divine intervention. That applies to the misuse of the Lord's Supper and it applied to the partaking of this fruit. Adam and Eve could have eaten the tree of life, roots and all. That would never have conveyed eternal life to them. It is God that conveys eternal life. In fact, it is God's special gift to men and women and to boys and girls. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, Romans 6 verse 23. It requires divine intervention. And when we read the narrative of the Garden of Eden, and when we read about what we call the fall of man into sin, we should always remember that the rules that God gave in the garden were simple and clear. Simple and clear. And you young folk here this evening, you remember this is a characteristic of the gospel it's simple and it's clear we ministers and preachers we tend to make these things more difficult and unclear than they are Paul speaks to the Corinthians of the simplicity that is in Christ and the rules that God set out for our first covenant parents, they were simple and they were clear. And they were based on two things. Love and obedience. Love and obedience. But you know, friends, <clears throat> all of God's rules for life and living, they're simple and they are clear. And it's nothing but sheer genius on the part of God that he could create a set of only ten rules, only ten rules to ensure human happiness at every level of his existence. Sheer genius. These rules, these commandments, they are recorded for us in Exodus chapter 20. They are without equal. They are without parallel. They reflect the genius of the mind of God. And I want you to remember something. And again, I'll speak to the young people because I want you to, sh to grasp this for yourselves and to share this with those who challenge you and what you believe. But the adults should remember this as well. It's crucial. It's never been so crucial. About the Ten Commandments. They are designed to help everyone. And to hurt no one. Always remember that. They are designed to help everyone and to hurt no one. And that, of course, was reflected in the past by the acceptance of the civilized world of the Ten Commandments as something that the world needed. You don't have to be a Christian to appreciate the value of the Ten Commandments. Civilized rational creatures recognized in the past that these laws were of huge importance and of great benefit 
to all of mankind. The tragedy of our modern world and of our contemporary society is that the Western world has sold these laws for a mess of pottage. They've sold these laws for a mess of pottage. And our leaders continue to adopt a substitute, a substitute of complex, crippling, and frequently cruel man-made laws and rules. Have you noticed that? And I want you to notice something else. Almost every other day, they are legislating ever more laws to compensate for the flaws in previous laws. You cannot replace what God has called perfect. You cannot replace it without a disaster unfolding. Oh, when will people ever learn? God knows best. Appreciate, my friends, the Ten Commandments. Whether it's the first table for religious expression, or the second table for social living, appreciate them for what they are, my friends. They are the very best. They are without peer, they are without equal, they are without parallel. And if you don't live by them, you're living a flawed life. You're living a flawed life. Let me move on to look at the glory of this paradise. As I mentioned earlier, the term paradise isn't used here, but it is evidently alluded to, as I mentioned, in the writing of John in the Revelation. Let me quote that verse again. Revelation 2, verse 7. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of a tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now it's obvious to me that uh, there is a play here on the Garden of Eden, on the Genesis narrative. The stunning beauty of it comes through in his use of this word, the paradise. The temptation of Adam and Eve is reflected in his using this term overcoming that's what they should have done they should have overcome the temptations of the devil and the trees the, the, the location of the tree in the midst of the garden he's obviously playing on the garden of Eden in writing in this way but what exactly made Eden a paradise was it its stunning aesthetic beauty? Is that what made it a paradise? I have to accept. We cannot even begin to imagine how beautiful Eden was. How beautiful the world was before man sinned. <clears throat> the world, you may have noticed, has borrowed this term, paradise, for its own use. And they've borrowed it from the Bible. The locations of stunning beauty are frequently described as paradise in holiday brochures. Yet we know that the most stunningly beautiful location on this earth is mine. It's deficient is spoiled by three things. And you remember this when you are attracted to these brochures or posters in travel agents, windows, promoting to you a paradise here for your holidays or a paradise there for your holidays. Imagine and remember when you see the most stunning location, you remember but three things mar that paradise. It's marred by sin. It's marred by the curse of God. And it's marred by the hand of man. 
No geographic location can compare to the paradise that was Eden before the fall. Yet it wasn't the aesthetics that made it a paradise. That's not what earned it the glory that belonged to it. Physical beauty, stunning colors, perfect contours, they don't make a paradise, my friends. Not in the biblical sense. But this does. The presence of Almighty God. The presence of Almighty God. That's always what makes the difference. The greatest difference to anything, anyone, any situation, any circumstance. The presence of Almighty God. In the Garden of Eden, other than time and space, there were no barriers between man and God. Now you have to use a little bit of sanctified imagination. If you want to draw near to God, you must make spiritual arrangements. You must prepare yourself. You just cannot waltz into God's presence any way you please. Adam didn't need to make any special arrangements to draw near to God before he sinned. And God didn't appear to Adam in, the Eden, in Eden only on occasion. God was always there. He was filling every square inch of Eden. And it didn't matter where Adam's eye fell, he saw God. He saw the evidence of God. He sensed the presence of God. And both of them, Almighty God on the one hand, and puny little Adam, both of them, they were in free-flowing communion. No interruptions, no distractions, no hindrances. That's paradise, my friends. That's paradise. When you have a sense of God in every second of the day, when you can talk to God every moment of the day, when God talks to you, that's paradise. And that's what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. That's why paradise is paradise. So the purpose of this Eden paradise was to provide this special environment which turned out to be a probationary uh, environment for Adam. I'll come to that in a moment. But here God would establish in this beautiful location, here God would establish the destiny of our humanity. In the eternal purpose of God, creatures bearing his image were to be recognized by two outstanding features. And as you sit here this evening, this applies to you. Two outstanding features mark you out if you are truly, believe yourself to be truly a Christian. Two outstanding characteristics, two outstanding traits, two outstanding features, love and obedience. Love and obedience. And Adam and Eve consciously and instinctively exercised this love and obedience towards God as a creator. You don't do that instinctively. Neither do I. That's not the natural inclination of our mind. We have to work at this, my friends. We have to exercise our faith 
against many, many obstacles and difficulties and challenges and temptations. But this is what gave these two people, these two beautiful people, this is what gave them the deepest sense of purpose and satisfaction, expressing their love and their obedience to their Creator. So their greatest delight and pleasure and satisfaction in paradise was to love and obey God, just like the second Adam. We shall be singing his testimony shortly in our closing praise. To do thy will, I take delight. And he did it instinctively, consciously, with every breath, to do thy will, I take delight. And that remains, my friends, true in principle for all humanity. You will only ever be fully satisfied in the deepest cravings of your soul and your mind when you are loving and obey the living God. Nothing can offer men and women and boys and girls the delight and the pleasure and the satisfaction that loving and obeying God affords us. And the reason for that is quite simple. God has designed and created us in such a way that love and obedience or loving Him and obeying Him touches on the deepest needs of our soul. That's how He has created us. And there's no substitute for this. Isn't this the tragedy of so many in the world? They see God's satisfaction in other ways. They pursue it in a thousand and one avenues. And it's all here free. All here free. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is the only way that you can satisfy the deepest craving in your soul because it is only Jesus that will help you to love and to obey your God. You get that part right in your lives, my friends, young people and adults alike. Everything else falls into place. Let me look thirdly at the role God gave man in paradise. There are different ways for us to consider who Adam and Eve were on the page of human history. They certainly were two individual personalities. They were the two of the most, they were the two most beautiful you know, human beings that ever lived. And they were biological parents for the entire human race. But for, this, for the purpose of this study, we have to separate them and we're going to focus on Adam. Because in paradise, God gave Adam a very special role in life. And to set the wheels of human history in motion, God made this man what we call the head of a covenant. The head of a covenant. And because he was the biological father of the human race, the covenant would also include all of humanity. I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible because it is not a simple subject. Such is the connection between, on the one hand, Adam as the head of this covenant and the race to whom he would give birth, such is the connection that we blend into one within the confines of the covenant. So when you, with sanctified imagination, 
when you look at Adam standing before these two trees in the garden, you should see yourself because you're there in him. You're there in him. Let me illustrate this for you by an example, with an example from scripture where we find in connection with this the phrase in his loins. Do you understand that you were in the loins of Adam in the Garden of Eden? We find this phrase in connection with Levi. This is how the New Testament describes how Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek through Abraham, even though generations separated them. You'll find this in Hebrews chapter 7. This is what it says. For he, Levi, was yet in the loins of Abraham when Melchizedek met him. He was in the loins of Abraham when Melchizedek met him. In that sense, my friends, we were all in the loins of Adam as he stood before those two trees in the Garden of Eden. Now the consequence of that is that as we watch Adam acting, we act in him. We can't afford the luxury of standing here and saying, well, if that was me, I wouldn't do that. We can't afford that luxury. Not only you would have, you did. You were in his loins so that his actions become our actions. The consequence for him becomes a consequence for all of us. Had he obeyed, of course, we would all have been blessed. But he didn't, did he? He disobeyed God and brought upon himself and upon all of humanity a threefold death. Death physical, death spiritual, and death eternal. What a cause, my friends. In that one moment, millions and millions and millions of men and women and boys and girls in every age and in every generation died three times. Unless God intervenes in our lives. First Corinthians fifteen twenty two As in Adam all die. Romans five nineteen by one man's disobedience many were made sinners. And this is what we should be thinking about whenever we read this narrative. As he stretched out his hand to take what his silly, silly wife was offering him. As he stretched out his hand and took that forbidden fruit, the covenant was broken. God withdrew. The race, the human race, was condemned. And paradise was lost. And God only returned to that garden in wrath and in judgment. And I want you to notice how he called Adam to account. Because this also applies to you. God, as the judge, 
comes back to the garden and he asks a question where art thou there's not a more solemn question my friends ever asked on the face of this earth where art thou it's not that God didn't know where he was God has an all-seeing eye this is God's way of asking Adam why aren't you where you are supposed to be why aren't you on the path of obedience why aren't you loving me with all your heart soul and mind where are you and that's the question God is asking every boy and girl and every man and woman here this evening where are you in relation to God where are you are you where you're supposed to be are you on the way of obedience are you loving God with all your heart soul and mind and my friends remember this is the judge of all the earth that's asking this question there is not a more important and significant question that you could give an answer to and to this question I am asking you here this evening in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ where are you in relation to God paradise was lost man became a shadow of his former glory the garden lost all its beauty to thorns and thistles and humanity became exposed to every illness and ailment imaginable but we're still we're still the sword of divine justice was now hanging over humanity condemnation and curse became the universal sentence of heaven so the damage of that one single act of disobedience the damage is incalculable not not this the loss of crucial elements of the image of God and humanity you weren't simply created as a human being as if you had no reference to God this is what makes us human beings that we are created in the image of God and it doesn't matter how far away from God you may go in your life you are still created in the image of God that's why you are human and not an animal that's what makes you so unique amongst all the species of the earth and not only are you created in the image of God you are created in the image of a triune God Father, Son and Holy Spirit and when par paradise was lost humanity also lost three crucial elements of that image he lost all true knowledge of God he lost the righteousness by which he could be accepted by God and he lost the holiness by which he could please God three crucial elements now as you sit here this evening my friend I want to ask you do you believe that in your own personal life and in your relationship with God do you believe that you have to some degree 
true knowledge of God. Do you believe that you have been made righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you believe that you are sufficiently holy to please God? Whatever the case for you, my friends, and whichever way you want to answer these questions, you will and do continue to be moral, rational, and accountable. And man, even with his darkened mind, with his seared conscience, with his rebellious will, he cannot rid himself of the law of God because it is written into his DNA. It's written into his DNA. The law that will condemn him eternally except for a merciful, gracious, loving, forgiving God. So when God expelled our first covenant head from the garden, it wasn't without hope. Genesis 3 verse 21, Unto Adam and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. What a wonderful token of mercy with its implied sacrifice and bloodshed. There is hope for humanity. And this is why we preach the gospel. This is why we evangelize. This is why we share the word of God with others. We come to them with the hope of the gospel. That the sacrifice has been made. That the blood has been shed. And that the living God is offering men and women, boys and girls, the way of salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that single act of mercy in the death of Christ is the only way by which we can regain paradise. People, and I'll just close with this, people the world over would love to live in a paradise. And they even attempt to create their own paradise with their exotic holidays, palatial homes, and forgetful experiences, and so on. However, all the money in this world can never buy and can never create a true, lasting paradise. Because paradise, as I said earlier, my friends, is infinitely more than sun, sand, and scenery. Infinitely more. Most important of all, God's paradise is offered to us freely in the gospel. And we will never get closer to God. And God will not be close to us until we put our faith in his beloved son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus was given a special name. He's called Emmanuel, a word that means God with us. Do you know Emmanuel. Is Emmanuel the lover of your soul? Does Emmanuel walk with you every day? Does Emmanuel hold your hand when you go through the dark valleys of this world? Does Emmanuel help you bear your burdens as you struggle on in life? Does Emmanuel help you to make God-glorifying choices and decisions? 
Emmanuel, God with us. The key to paradise. I warmly commend him to you, my friends, as a Savior this evening. Let's pray. Gracious, blessed, holy God, Emmanuel, hear us, receive of us, bless us in the gospel, bless the word to us, bless the thought of paradise to us. And as we lie in our beds tonight, Help us to think about these things, to be challenged by them, and to seek after Emmanuel, his salvation, his forgiveness, his pardon, his mercy, his love, and all we ask is for his glory's sake. Amen.